Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. Yo, what is up, everybody? How you guys doing this evening? So uh, probably a little different here. I'm sitting next to someone. I've never actually had anybody on the stream before. So uh, this is my buddy, Brett. I didn't call him Kevin this time. I keep calling him <laughs> Kevin. But uh, this is my buddy, Brett, from the Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. Um, there's going to be a uh, moderator bot posting, you know, whatever, the links to their website. But it's advancedrefrigerationpodcast.com. Yep. If you go to advancedrefrigerationpodcast.com, you'll find links to their social media. You'll find links to their podcast, um, and uh, you can find out where to follow them. It's easier to do that just to direct you to his website. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you guys just set up the website, right? Yeah. Um, my Actually, my wife's been working on it for a little bit. Uh, we actually just uh, opened up the merch store. Um, so we have a whole bunch of shirts that we're, that we're putting up there. Um, surely but slowly, just putting more stuff up there. Um, any kind of articles we've ever uh, been in, Kevin and myself, uh, and, you know, any anything that has to do with the podcast. Uh, eventually, what we're going to do is um, is have a media portion of the page. So anything that we're talking about, any kind of IOMs or troubleshooting guys that we talk about during the podcast, we'll be putting that up there as well. That's cool. So what what's the whole reason behind why you guys started the podcast in general? I can't sleep. You can't sleep. Okay. <laughs> is that a supermarket problem? Yeah, it is. Well, no, because your schedule gets all messed up, right? And so 3 o'clock in the morning, um, I got through, like, I'm going through a YouTube funnel and just checking out different refrigeration stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, you know, people were just giving bad information. And so I had texted Kevin because he usually gets up early in the morning to, to work out. And I texted him. I'm like, hey, I think we should start a podcast. He's like, what? I was like, yeah, I think it'll be really good. You know, let's start a podcast. You know, it's not going to uh, take that take that much cash to to get one started. Um, you know, let's start one and see what is what happens. And you know, nine months later, it's it's just blown up to this thing that is unimaginable. Like I never thought in a million years we'd have such a strong following that we have. It, it very similar. I never, you know, I started my stuff just making videos for my employees, and I was very anxious to make them public. I never really planned on it, and. I, I wanted to, you know, and at the time I saw Brian, Brian Orr from HVAC school was making his stuff and his stuff had kind of just started. And I was like, you know, 
I think I'm gonna hit this public button. And I hit it and it just turned into this machine and it just kept growing. And I can't tell you for me, and I'd be curious to see how you feel about it, but the, the satisfaction you get just from being able to talk to people and you know, even in my, my little stuff, I do light commercial refrigeration and air conditioning. Right. But even be able to help someone, you know, understand something, you know, simplify things. Like I s explain things using what I call dumb logic. Like I try to break it down to the simplest forms when I've explained, you know, it sounds silly, but like when I explain how an expansion valve works, right. And why you have to have a pressure differential across an expansion valve, I use a hose with your finger over the hose. You know, you, you push it over, you got high pressure, it shoots it far. But if you don't have high pressure, it doesn't shoot it as far. You know, I use that dumb logic to, to explain things. But the satisfaction that I get out of doing that is really cool. You guys kind of get something similar? Absolutely. Like, so I, the, I call it the light bulb effect. Like, like so this week I'm, I'm teaching in, in California. And, you know, it, the one thing that's extremely satisfying is just watching the light bulb go off where, you know, they, they're like, I get it. I get yeah. it where they've struggled. Um, you know, and I've told this story, this other story before, like, you know, the first guy that I worked for, um, you know, talked down to me all the time and told me I wasn't ever going to mount to anything. And, and, you know, I, I promised myself if I ever got decent at what I do, um, I was going to change that, you know, and, and, and not, not make people, you know, afraid to ask questions. So like, I mean, that's one of the biggest things like on the, you know, our site as well as, you know, the supermarket refrigeration tech talk, when guys start bashing other guys, that's one of the, one of the biggest pet peeves I have. Cause I know that feeling and yeah. you know, no one wants to advance if they're being told, you know, that they're not doing good. You know what I mean? At least they're trying. I agree. And I feel like, you know, social media is a great thing, but I also feel like some people are just, assholes. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, and, it, and it's a bummer. Some people are the smartest people out there, but they just don't know how to interact with people. And, um, it, it's, it's hard because, you know, for, for us to, to spend a long day working frustrating, right. I'm running a business doing all my stuff. And then, and then you come home and you try to help someone and they, they ask you a question online or whatever. And they, you know, uh, how do I fix it? And they, you could tell they're not even trying. They just want you to answer it for them. Like it can be frustrating, you know, and, and it's about learning how to deal with people and how to interact with people. And, you know, but at the same time, it, it I've said this so many times context. Like if you ask a question, you, I, I tell this to people, you know, when, if you're going to call technical support before you call technical support, you need to seriously take a notepad, whatever you need to do and write down everything you could possibly think they're going to ask you. I bet you if you do that, you'll probably solve your own problem before you even get on the phone with them. But even still, you have all the questions right in front of you, right? Now, it also doesn't excuse people from being jerks, okay? I can remember, um, I've been driven by being embarrassed a lot. I've There was a lot of times in my career that I didn't know answers to things. There was one time I called, I was talking to Hoshizaki Ice Machine Technical Support. I've told this story a bunch of times. I was working on a Flaker Ice Machine and uh, he asked me what the superheat was on, you know, for the expansion valve and I, I didn't know what superheat was. And I said, well, what's superheat? And all I heard was the phone click. And wow, okay, you know, but... But I tell you what, I was embarrassed and I knew that I still had to fix this problem. So I went home that night. I researched everything. I knew how to check it. I knew how to do it. When I called him back the next day, I knew it. Now, while I don't really appreciate the way that he hung up on me, I understand he was probably having a crappy day. I'm not excusing him being a jerk, but, you know, the more information we give someone when we ask for help, I think the better. Um, and, you know, sometimes people on social media, they can be kind of rude about things and you know, it is what it is. It's, it's kind of a bummer. Unfortunately, um, you know, there's such a, uh, a big age gap in the skilled trades right now. You know, a lot of the senior mechanics I'd imagine in the supermarket side, and even on my side, a lot of the senior mechanics are in their fifties, sixties years old, you know, if not older, I mean, sometimes, you know, and, um, you and I are about the same age and uh, there's not a huge amount of our age people we're in just about in our forties. There's not a huge, I mean, there's, there's some, but you know, it, it's, there's a big gap. And then we have a, a influx of a lot of younger people now. And, and that's where we run into the problems when people aren't ready to, you know, give us the information we need when they want to ask for help and stuff. And I feel like we need to, you know, help a little bit more, but back to the point that I was making when I started this conversation was I get this satisfaction from being able to help people, even if it's the simplest thing. And it's really cool too. And I'm curious about your, opinion on this to get an email from someone in 
Australia or in wherever, you know, and or to find out someone from Australia is listening to your podcast or whatever. Like, that's really cool to know people around the world are listening to this stuff. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. it's a trip. So um, so now when you guys started the podcast mm -hmm. and um, did you did you tell your your work? Did you tell them you were going to do this? How, how did that come about? I mean, no, we uh, you know, we basically just, you know, we're coming up with ideas and and. And I actually felt like kind of guilty, like I like I was debating on sending an email to you know because I, I, before I have got this title, I was a regional trainer, so I was going all over the place, all over Texas and Oklahoma, and teaching guys. And I might say it to the tech, but I was like honestly thinking about you know maybe I should pass this along to everyone so they could listen. But I kind of felt like it was shameless publicity. I'm like, hey, listen to my stuff, you know, just because you work with me. Um, and I kind of refrained from doing that for a little bit, but mm -hmm. then I was like, no, you know what? That you know, other people are saying that this is becoming extremely helpful to them. So yeah. why don't I share it? You know what I mean? Yeah. When when I started my stuff for the longest time, and even still, I don't advertise my company name. Like I don't go out there and say this is my company name, but everybody knows it because I stopped hiding it. You know, in the beginning, I was kind of like, I don't know if I want the publicity. I didn't know if it was going to turn negative and whatever. But it's it's all good. I kind of stopped being worried about it and. Um, it's pretty cool. So, um, as usual, guys, you guys have questions, throw them in the chat. Let's put them in caps lock. Uh, we'll definitely, if you guys have any supermarket related questions or anything that Brett can help you out with, I have a, a question or two for him. And then I have a few things that I want to cover as usual on my stream. So remember, if you guys do have questions, put them in the chat in caps lock. If we don't get to them, keep reposting them. If we don't answer them during the stream, send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Okay. It's going to be hard. A um, couple little things I want to talk, and I'll bring some things up. So uh, someone had commented something about uh, the Infocon Stratus leak detector. Have you used that one yet? No, I'm, I'm, I'm still on my H10. Okay, to be and then that's fine. <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's an interesting uh, shift. Some people really love the H10, and that's all they use. I'm more of a portable guy, handheld. But something I wanted to point out was... I keep seeing on social media, uh, I have the Infocon Stratus. I have the Stratus, and then I have the Fieldpiece DR82, which they're both the same leak detector, just one's $500 more, basically. But um, uh, on the Stratus, it's a great leak detector. It does everything I need it to do. You need to understand something, though. The Stratus had something called cloud hunting mode, okay? Cloud hunting modes gives you a PPM readout, parts per million readout on the leak detector. There's a digital display. It says 600 parts per million, whatever. I, can't, I see people all the time posting videos and using the cloud hunting mode, and I don't know if they quite understand. Now, I didn't know this at first, too, but the cloud hunting mode on the Stratus leak detector is actually not the most sensitive mode. So people like to see the PPM readout. If you want to get a more sensitive leak detector, you need to put it on the super mode or the high mode within that leak detector. Uh, the cloud hunting mode, the whole purpose of that is actually for supermarket guys, okay? Um, if you're walking into a motor room, an equipment room that has a giant leak, okay? First off, you shouldn't be walking into a motor room without some kind of breathing apparatus. I know that's probably not going to happen. But, I mean, if you're walking into a room that you have to put your leak detector on cloud hunting mode, you need to understand you're breathing that in too, okay? All of us have done it, but... Um, when you put it on cloud hunting mode and you walk into a motor room, it gives you a PPM readout. So that way, as you get closer to the leak, you know, and it's not just going off with the audible tone screaming at you. Okay. So if you guys are using the Stratus and cause I've seen some people say it sucks, it doesn't work. You need to know how to use it right. And the cloud hunting mode is actually a little bit less sensitive than if you put it on the regular leak detecting mode, which will not give you a PPM readout. Just food for thought. I was uh, talking to someone in an email about that. So, no, every, every, everyone that I've talked to that that uses the Stratus, they absolutely love it. Um, and I guess there's also, you know, because now with supermarkets, you know, we're dealing with CO2. Mm -hmm. And there's actually, I believe, with the regular Stratus, you can buy. It's like a module that yeah, you pop that in it or something. Yeah, plugs in that that can allow you to do. Um, you know, R744. And that's that's pretty cool, the whole CO2 thing, because that is the future, guys. I mean, that is what's coming. CO2 and hydrocarbon refrigerants. Um, if, if, if the, whatever, the hippie people had their way, you know, CO2 and, and hydro... You actually, to be honest with you, if the hippies had all their way, we wouldn't be using any refrigerant. We wouldn't be using any air conditioning. But um, hydrocarbons are what's coming. They're about to raise the charge limitations to hydrocarbons to 500 grams, I think, for... Really? Yeah, that's that's coming, and it's... Uh, actually, it's going to be 500 grams for open cases, 
which is interesting because in supermarkets they're getting away from open cases, right? Didn't they actually put glass doors on all the? Yeah, I mean they're starting to. Uh, you know. Which which kind of dumbfounded me when they came out and said. It's going to be 500 grams for open cases. And it's like most open cases. I mean, now you guys still use coffin cases, but most of your like ice cream freezers and all that stuff are, um, and, you know, reach and grab ins, they all have doors on them now. So, anyways, that's a whole nother yeah, thing. Yeah, the, the government actually, they, they can't, they used to make uh, these multi deck frozen food cases that have basically had three different air curtains. Yeah. One that was basically right off the uh, coil, um, and then a secondary one that took a little bit of, of coil, coil air and outside air. And then the third one was the last ambient one. But because of now the government cracking down on the UL ratings, you know, they're not even allowed to make those cases anymore. That's interesting. So um, we're seeing a lot of government regulations coming up. They're telling me that your mic is low. So apparently my adjusting of the mic <laughs> messed everything up. So we'll keep playing with it. If it's too low, we'll adjust it up. It was loud in my ears and I was a dumb dumb and lowered it down too much. So. <laughs> Um, uh, hydrocarbons too. I kind of wanted to get your thought about this. So I work with a lot of R290, the most common hydrocarbon that I deal with. And, um, I think, uh, I think it is the future. I think it's going to be out there a lot as soon as they raise the charge limitations. It honestly doesn't scare me too much. It's just another refrigerant. Um, and, and I think that's important for us to understand. Uh, I go off on these tangents all the time, but you know, we have constant, uh, we're constantly evolving in this trade. There's always new stuff. And if we're afraid to embrace change, we're going to get left behind. But I can promise you something. If you're a service technician and you know what you're doing, you are you don't need to be afraid of losing your job. As long as you're not a jerk and you know how to do your work, you're going to have a job for life. But if you're afraid to embrace change, like hydrocarbon refrigerants, um, CO2, uh, ECM, everything, VFDs driving everything, all this different stuff. Yeah, it's something that's frustrating. A new flavor of refrigerant every day, it seems like. There's new stuff, right? Um, if we carried every refrigerant in our vans, there, there, there's no way. Well, uh, this, this, uh, there's another YouTuber. Um, I'm not going to mention him because I don't want to get him in trouble, but he posted something about all the different refrigerants because he started doing some supermarket work, but he still does light commercial and air conditioning and stuff. Yeah. And I want to say he has like 30 bottles of, of 30 pound drums of refrigerant. It's like, dude, where's the DOT limit on that for yeah, that's a lot. But anyways, what I'm getting at is, is there's so many different flavors of refrigerant. They're changing every day. We can't be afraid of that stuff because guess what? If we're willing to embrace the change. It's just a money making thing for us as technicians, right? Because we're in demand. We're constantly going to be needing to fix everything out there, you know, and, and change is here. We just have to. And even I sometimes get a little stubborn, like I don't want to, you know, change or I don't want to try this new thing. But it, inevitably, you have to. I mean, you have to embrace it. And sometimes it's, you know, it's fear. I mean, that's what the like we have. a We're starting to do a lot more uh, CO2 in, in Texas um, and guys are just afraid and like you know, mostly afraid because of the pressures. So a cascade system, you know, doesn't run, you know, transcritical pressures, transcritical is like 1200, 1300, you know, PSI. Um, cascade runs on the suction side, usually it's about 200, 220. Mm -hmm. And then on the discharge side, it's, you know, 450, maybe 500 if it goes off on high pressure. So it's not really that much different. Um, it's the fear of the pressures. And then the other fear is, um, Basically, you know, the fear of making dry ice, because if you have uh, liquid CO2 mm -hmm. and you open it up straight up to atmosphere, it will actually turn into dry ice. Okay. There's a procedure that you have to follow in order so that doesn't happen. But as long as you follow those procedures. Are people afraid that they're going to make dry ice in the system? Yes. Okay. So, yes. so it's the same concept of, of uh, freezing moisture in a vacuum where it's not really going to happen. It's, 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 it's a really difficult thing to do, but everybody's afraid of it. So they're constantly blaming it. And so, know. so with, uh, with CO2, right. The, um, at 87, I'm sorry, 84 degrees, the pressure of CO2 is 1047 or something like that. So, you know, one, one thing that people are afraid of is if they isolate a coil incorrectly, even though there's safeties and all kinds of other stuff, um, basically, uh, you know, you could potentially, if you close it off the inlet and outlet and it, it expands rapidly, you could blow the, blow the coil. The other thing that they have, um, like I said, if they're afraid of actually making dry ice and if you make dry ice inside a coil, it's going to rapidly mm -hmm. expand yeah. and then potentially really damage that coil. Right. Um, Bill has a funny comment. Bill says that he thinks that it smells like an old encyclopedia in here now. <laughs> Bill, <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, for everybody that's in here right now, let's because uh, I'm sure there's new people coming in. This is Brett. Uh, he's from the Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. 
him and Kevin Compass. See, I didn't mix up your name again. See, I'm getting it right, okay? <laughs> him and Kevin Compass do a podcast. Uh, if you go to advancedrefrigerationpodcast.com, you can find all their information. They're on probably all the podcast platforms. Um, and uh, they also that's their website. They're also on social media, YouTube channel, just Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You'll find it all. Um, so we're, we're talking about a few different things. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump on my list of things to talk about here real quick. I wanted to get your take on this one, too. So Jose asked me, um, I get a lot of this, people being afraid that they're going to uh, fractionate refrigerants. So Jose asked me if he tries to top off the charge on a 448A system, if he's going to fractionate the refrigerant, if there's going to be a problem, does he need to dump the whole charge and start over? Now, me personally, um, there's going to be... Uh, you know, if, if, if I found that a system had leaked out 75% of the charge on my stuff, I'd probably go ahead and pull the refrigerant out and put it back in. But majority of the time when I'm working on my systems, I top off all day long. I don't run into problems. Where's your threshold on that? So in, in commercial and industrial, I mean, you know, we're, we're dealing with a larger scale. So it would take a lot longer to really worry about. You're talking with systems that have anywhere from, you know, 800 to maybe 1,500 pounds, right? Yeah. So you have that... Um, if it's a, even if it's a smaller system, I, I I don't know unless unless the system's actually starting to have issues where you know I've checked all the all the pressures and all the temperatures and, and you so, can't figure out what's going on. Correct. So then, At that yeah. point, then we yank it out. I've pretty much been told by Honeywell Refrigerants that you don't really need to worry about fractionization when it comes to 448A. Um, it's not really that big of a deal. I was reading an article before the stream just real quick, and you know it, it's so nominal. If, if it did, it's so nominal that you, I, most of the time you don't really need to worry about it too much. Um, obviously, we're not there with you, so you need to make educated decisions when you're out in the field. But that's one, I think, one of the common myths. And, and I remember that, too, coming out with 410A. When 410A was still you know evolving and coming out, everybody was afraid. Oh, my gosh, this is going to be a nightmare. You have to have a separate set of gauges for every refrigerant. Um, you're going to have moisture contaminant. <sighs> Calm down with all that stuff. It's not that I use one set of gauges. OK, it's not a big deal. I'm just smart. If I if I use my set of gauges and I'm working on a 22 system and it's uh, got a lot of uh, oil traveling with the refrigerant, and it's all OK. I'm going to purge my hoses. I'm obviously not going to mix gases. OK, but the, the, the fear of of contaminating that stuff is, I think, a little overblown. See, I'm a little anal retentive. So the, the, as far as I go, I usually I don't mix so I had basically five set of gauges. So you're uh, going to call me an idiot right now? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just saying I'm Mr. Anal Retentive. So like, you know, because so I've had some some refrigerant hoses that have been 12 years old. And then the only reason why they lasted that long is because I, you know, basically if it was uh, mineral alkabenzene, uh, I used, you know, those two set of gauges. If it was polyester, it was, you know, those two set of gauges. Mm -hmm. And if it was 410A, just because of the pressure, I would use that set of gauges. So okay. it was just me trying to get longevity, at, you know, out, um, out of the out of the gauges and stuff. Because then, you know, you notice that the more times that you mix from one oil to another, the rubbers on the end where you're actually hooking up and yes. you're getting chewed up real bad. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of alleviated that a little bit. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right. So um, real quick, before I forget, guys, I am going to be at the iHacky trade show in Pasadena tomorrow. I'll be there. It starts at like 10 a.m. I'll be there at 10 a.m. and probably be hanging out till 2 p.m. ish, something like that. Uh, if you see me walking around the show, if you guys happen to make it, stop me and say, hey, you know, something about me. And I'm curious about your thought on this, too. So people um, every once in a while, people will recognize me. You know, I'll be in a supply house and I can tell someone's kind of looking at me doing a double take. And then I'll get an email later. Hey, I saw you in the supply house, man. I was a little afraid to come up and say hi. And it's like, guys, okay, first off, I have tunnel vision. When I'm doing something, like I'm, if I'm at a supply house and I'm going to get a part, I'm focused, okay? A lot of times I'm not really thinking, oh man, this guy's looking at me, you know, or whatever. I may recognize it, but I don't really say anything. Stop me. Say hey, okay? I don't mind. I'm telling everybody. If you guys see me, stop me, say what's up. Have you, has, how do you feel about that stuff? So it, it, the first couple of times it happened, it was just, it was just odd. Like, you know, I, I I'll agree. I'll agree. I'll, but keep going. But yes, but it like, was odd. So I was, I was on a job site and we, we were in the midst of losing, you know, these, the certain customer at the time, you know, cause you know, customers with, with, with commercial, you know, they'll go, they'll go back and forth to different contractors based off whatever, whatever mm -hmm. reason. Um, and I introduced myself and I, I've always been extremely humble. You know what I mean? I don't try to think that I know everything cause no one wants to talk to no. that guy that thinks he's not, you know, that yeah. is being an asshole. So like I, I basically just was, um, talking to him. Hey, you know, nice to meet you. You know, I heard you guys are taking over the stores. My name is Brett Wetzel. 
and he paused and he did like like didn't know what to say and he's like I, you, podcast fa- facebook and like couldn't get whole yeah sentences out and i was like and it was just it was it was extremely it was, it was the sentiment was nice but it just it just got a little weird it's a little weird okay i'm gonna tell you a story so um Forgive me if you're watching right now, okay? I'm sorry, but this was weird. I've never said this live, but I'm going to say it now, okay? I don't know if you're watching. There's a female that one time, I got a phone call one day, and uh, it was right when my my streaming started, okay? Um, this was probably about three years ago. I got a phone call on my cell phone, and it said, Hi, I'm so-and-so, and I watch your videos. And I was kind of like, I, again, I didn't have very many subscribers. like, And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, it was a little weird, and I go, um, I thought she was going to ask me for a job because I get people calling me, right? Not not that, but I thought it was this, this girl called and she says, I'm an HVAC technician and I watch your videos and my stomach dropped. Like, what? How did, how did you? And then she proceeded to tell me how she got my information. And, oh, I heard you one time on a podcast and then I looked up your name. I heard you were part of an organization. So I researched that organization. I found the officer's list and then I went through the officer's list and I found that your phone number was associated with it. And it was just like, you went through all that. She basically played to, seven degrees of Kevin yeah. Bacon to get your number. <laughs> and, and again, I'm sorry if you're watching. I really am. I, you probably didn't mean anything by it, but it just kind of creeped me out at first. And um, it was a little awkward. But then on top of that, I ran into her at the iHockey trade show three years ago. She mm-hmm. walked up and she goes, hi, I'm so-and-so. And then my stomach dropped a little bit more. I was just like... Okay. And then, of course, too, I told my wife right away, I was like, hey, I just want you to know this person just randomly called me, and I, I just want you to know that there's nothing here. I, it, it was a little awkward, but anyways, I'm sorry to put you on blast if you're watching right now. I'm not going to say your name or anything, but um, all right, so let's go ahead and get to a couple more things going on. Um, it looks like your mic's fixed, so that's cool. Uh, looks like uh, John Cruz is saying 2,600 pounds, a 134A, and a 200-ton chiller. Yeah, that's a lot of refrigerant, so... Um, all right, cool. We're good with that. Hey, that's the cool thing. Someone posted on here that they said, uh, just, just vent it to atmosphere and yell de minimis. And there's kind of a joke that if you, if you vent things to atmosphere and and say de minimis, it means de minimis loss. Like it was an accident, right? Obviously don't vent refrigerant to the atmosphere. But the interesting thing is, is when you're working with hydrocarbons and R290, it is a trip to work on something and, Okay, so I'm supposed to just release this into the atmosphere. That's interesting. It's a little like you feel like you're doing something dirty here, you know, when you're doing that. Same same thing with CO2, and it's it's weird because you're you're just like just blowing the charge. I mean, because you you can't use a reclaim machine on it because the pressure increase would be astronomical. You'd end up blowing up the the reclaim machine and or the actual tank because it's not made for that kind of pressure. Yeah. And so like you know you have something that's vapor that you know you can't pump down anymore let it go yeah that's a trip it's 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 very weird and on my my level i'm working on small amounts of hydrocarbon but even still i just i feel like i'm doing something wrong like and again okay i'm gonna preface this with this uh pre-1992 before it was against the law to vent refrigerants i can remember taking a rag wrapping it around a hose stepping on it and just venting it okay again pre-1992 all that fancy stuff right but uh, to do that now with R290, like to get the rag out, put it under my foot and vent it, it's like, oh, yeah, this brings back memories. This is not right. <laughs> it's different. But um, so let's answer a question. Uh, Foster Dad David is saying that their freezer, so we're talking about a walk-in freezer, has ice underneath the threshold, and it's rising about a half an inch off the floor. And they believe that there's ice ice formation under the threshold. Is there anything that can be done for this? Yeah, there is. Okay. When you have a walk-in freezer, first off, you have to find out why water got under the floor. Okay. One of the most common things that I tell people all the time when you're working in walk-in freezers, especially if you have a raised floor. Okay. So it's not on concrete. You have a raised floor. This applies to if it's on concrete too, because if you get water on a concrete floor in a walk-in freezer, it's going to turn into an ice skating rink and it's miserable and horrible to clean up, especially the bigger the freezer it gets. But if you're working on a raised floor walk-in freezer and you get water on the floor eventually that water will seep under the floor and if it gets under the floor it will freeze and it will lift up the floor the only solution to that is to completely dry out the floor find the source of the water majority of the time replace the floor because how are you going to get the floor dry unless you put heaters in there and bring the temperature of the entire box up you know ridiculously high but um, you you can fix it. So you have water under your threshold. You need to find out why. OK, there should be a door heater around the freezer door. Um, maybe the door heater's working. Maybe it's not. But 
you really need to dig on those things. Uh, I find people when they fix walk in freezer doors, when they fix heaters, when they fix thresholds, majority of the time I find that people don't do their due diligence to get rid of all the water and the moisture. You need to dig, you need to dry it up, use torches, use whatever completely dried up. Then you need to seal it when you repair it. So if it's just a threshold repair, dry it all up, fill it with expanding foam, whatever you're going to do, make sure that the heater is still in there and then seal it all off with silicone and everything. But it is repairable, but it's not a quick fix. Honestly, uh, foster dad, David, it kind of sounds like you're not an HVACR service technician and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with people asking questions that aren't HVACR techs, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you are not a technician, I would not advise trying to fix that yourself. Um, cause you're dealing with uh, door heaters, electricity, and it's a pretty tedious process. So you want to get a technician involved. And if you are a technician, forgive me, but same thing applies. Okay. Just be careful about that. Um, could have a threshold heater too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely could. Sometimes you'll have door heaters, uh, door frame heaters, th depending on the size threshold heaters. Yeah. Good point. Um, there's, there's all kinds of different stuff that can happen with that. Uh, I've done work for, I used to do work for a big hospital and uh, they had a giant freezer. And uh, whenever we would defrost the coil or do PMs and things, you know, tiny bits of water would drip on the floor. And it was such a miserable nightmare because that thing was, and that's why I said, if, especially if you're in a big freezer, because if you're in a small freezer, you shut it off, the temperature is going to rise pretty quick. But if you're in a big freezer, it doesn't rise. You're in jackets, beanies, gloves, and everything. And no matter what you do, you, if for us, we're trying to melt this ice with a map gas torch, and that wasn't working. So then we're getting out our oxyacetylene torch, and we're heating up the tile, and it's free freezing just as fast as where it's it's a giant nightmare. So anytime we're doing that work, it's all about taking your time, trying not to make a mess. Um, I want to get your opinion on this because there's a common thing on social media when you're defrosting a walk-in freezer that is not hot gas defrost, okay? So mm -hmm. electric defrost. Mm -hmm. um, are you getting a torch out or are you using a hose? Water. Okay. Water is the only thing that I use. Why don't you use a torch? I'm curious. Uh, bad experience. And what was that? <laughs> um, so so let me let me say first what I, what I use. Basically, um, I have a hose adapter that goes down to about a quarter inch piece of copper. Mm -hmm. uh, just an adapter that I bought from Home Depot. So that way it's, it's more controlled. Okay. So it's more precise. I can actually stick it in between the coils. Um, w bad experience. So the one of the when I started working industrial, um, I was with a technician and he had been in the trade forever. And this evaporator was probably 10 foot long, probably about four foot high. Um, just huge, huge evaporator. It was an a industrial blast, blast freezer. And uh, I was like, well, how are we going to get rid of this ice? He's like, oh, we're just going to use a torch. So he pulls out uh, what I can only refer to as a torch down. You told me this story. This yeah. is a good one. <laughs> Keep going. A torch down, a torch down uh, torch. So basically the big flamethrower looking thing that hooks up to a propane tank. Uh, you guys ever see tank. roofers? If you've ever been on a roof and watching roofers lay down asphalt, uh, the, the, the asphalt mastic material crap. Yep, yep. So we're up there and the, the freezer's huge and, and the, the door's, you know, standard height. But then... There's basically another three foot section from the top of the door to the top of the box. Excuse me. And and I was um, I was looking up because they had regular thermostats controlling this thing. And I remember looking up and I was like, huh, it's 129 degrees in here because all the heat was basically I'm getting trapped yeah. and just staying up top. Two seconds later, all of a sudden I hear Psh, and I'm, I'm I'm like I look over at the guy. I'm like, what, what did you do? I thought like he was heating it up so much that he basically penetrated, you know, through one of the coils because the thing throws off a lot of heat. Yeah. He's like, I wasn't even on there that long. And the the air sound was followed by a massive stream of water. So if anyone doesn't know, um, sprinkler systems in freezers, uh, their element busts at about 132. So when I was jokingly saying, huh, it's 129 degrees in here, two seconds later, uh, we're running to find the, you know, the, the 12 or, or 18 inch main that was there for the water. Oh, wow. Not a fun time. No. So for me, what I find is using a torch in my experience in a uh, walk in evaporator in reaching coolers, anything like that. What's going to happen and where's that heat going to go? There's a lot of heat there, but you, you have the potential to melt things. You have electrical, especially on the smaller stuff. You have wires, you have heater wires, literally just ran through the coil through some fake little conduits and things, right? And I find that people end up melting things. That or they'll melt the aluminum fins right off the coil, especially if you're getting a torch right up into there. Like the, the little aluminum fins will melt off. Personally, 
a hose with hot water seems so much more efficient to me and it works faster. I've tried the torch method because people try to convince me and I'm like, all right, I'll try this. And I just find it to be much more time consuming. If you do it right now, me personally, I'm working on smaller stuff. So if I'm working on a walk-in freezer evaporator, I take out all three, four of the motors, pull out the blades, pull the sides off, make sure the drain is clear, and then I fill it up. And then I'm paying attention too. I'm not just blasting it in there, letting it overflow. As the drain starts to fill up, I stop, let it drain out, start over. And even doing that for me, it still seems like it's more efficient and goes faster and uh, I can defrost most walk-in freezers pretty darn quick, as long as you go through the steps, you know, and follow everything, obviously turn everything off. Um, little side note, uh, years ago, we were doing a walk-in cooler evaporator replacement and I had another guy working with me. Don't ever trust someone else when they tell you the power's off, okay? <laughs> Don't. So this was me too, by the way. So my technician that was working with me said, we were pulling the evaporator out and he goes, is power off? And I said, yeah. So on my stuff, commonly the condensing unit on the roof controls the power to the evaporators, okay? So we typically don't have independent breakers for the evaporator. It's the same disconnect on the roof. So turn off the disconnect, the power's disconnected to the evaporator, but it wasn't for the drain line heater. And I told my technician, yeah, power's off. He gets in there with a set of linemen's and he made wire strippers out of his linemen's because <clears throat> stuff went everywhere and it's my fault. Because I told him power was off, but again, don't ever trust when people tell you power's off. Because now, granted, he was dealing with a 120 volt circuit or even a 208 volt circuit, but still, in the right circumstances, that can still hurt you. Okay, so always double check yourself. Um, there's nothing wrong with verifying someone else's diagnoses, uh, making sure that it's right. You know, to an extent, that people make mistakes. So. And people, unfortunately, they have this, uh, you know, they do it with me all the time where they're, you know, I, well, I don't I don't need to check it. I don't need to check it. You know, Brett checked it. It's fine. And one of the, and I, I hate doing it, but I love doing it where basically, you know, I'll, I'll have the conversation. Hey, if you're working with me, you know, you just don't trust anybody. And I told the tech to go over and change out a contactor. And he goes out over there without his meter, starts putting the screwdriver. I'm like, what the hell? What are you doing? He's like. I'm, I'm doing what you told me. I was like, and I also told you not to trust me. I was yeah. like, you don't know what. I, no. Something could have happened. No, you know, no, always double check. Um, always be careful. Don't, and, and, you know, we're going to get kind of silly. I'm going to get kind of silly right here, but always remember, uh, always make sure, you know, one of the things I want to point out, even myself, I'm guilty of it. My meter leads, meter leads should be, they're like a consumable. You should be changing your meter leads at least once a year, if not sooner. Okay. They're not that much. And you'd be surprised, especially depending on how you store your meter. I store mine in my bag and the meter leads get bent in a weird way and the wires get exposed, try to be safe. You know, always double check your tools. That, that's me personally. I like to change them at least once a year. Um, if you have insulated screwdrivers, if they still show any cuts or anything in there, don't be using your insulate. First off, I, I had a talk with one of my technicians the other day. I'm like, that's my insulated screwdriver. We don't use that one to hit on things, you know, because that one is specifically for tightening up lugs without turning the disconnect off. So that one is fragile. It stays in a nice place. So always be cautious about that stuff, guys. Now, Honestly, I don't think about what I do, and maybe maybe for you, you can say the same, but I don't think what I do is difficult, but my apprentice that's working with me probably thinks it's a super complicated job. Would you agree it's kind of the same for you? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. to an extent, right? I mean, you, 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 you have a routine, you know what you're doing, so it's... It's, it's easy for us to assume that everybody else knows what we're thinking. It's easy for us, to, or at least for me, to assume sometimes. So sometimes I have to step back and remember, okay, I do need to educate people on this kind of stuff. So um, speaking of apprentices, well, first off, let me answer this real quick. So for those that are just coming in here right now, this is my buddy, Brett Wetzel. He is from the Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. So if you guys don't already know, go to advancedrefrigerationpodcast.com. Brett and Kevin Compass do a advanced refrigeration podcast, right? <laughs> They're both supermarket technicians, and uh, they, they both work different parts of the country, but... Um, they got together because they're like-minded people and they started a podcast similar to what I'm doing, but mine's more light commercial. Theirs is much more advanced. Okay. So, um, they do a great job and they've got all kinds of stuff in the future coming out, more videos and different things right now. It's mainly podcasts, Audio. but there's a few things going on, but, um, something I wanted to address right now too. I usually don't talk about this stuff very often. Okay. Content creators, right? Um, we rely on on uh, uh, majority of the time, like I rely on YouTube AdSense, okay? YouTube AdSense is a way that when you guys watch my video and they play a commercial, um, well, let's, let me rephrase this because you have to be careful the way you talk about this on YouTube. If you watch someone else's content and you skip through their commercials, 
they don't make money from that video, okay? So there's other ways to support content creators. We take our time, we, we, we give you information, we spend hours a day doing this kind of stuff. Brett and Kevin have set up a website, advancedrefrigerationpodcast.com. They just started selling merchandise. If you guys like their content, if you like what they're doing, help them out, go to their website, buy a shirt, right? It's a cool way of supporting the, the platform and you get something in return. I guarantee that they're not making $50 a shirt. They're just trying to make a little bit of something and help you guys get something. And they're giving you guys their knowledge. So help to support their platform. Go to advancedrefrigerationpodcast.com. Buy a shirt, okay? Help to support it. And stay tuned because I'm sure they're going to have other methods. Uh, do you guys have a Patreon and stuff like that set up? You know, I set one up, but I... I well, stay tuned. They'll, they'll have that <laughs> stuff set up soon and everything. I'm still learning. <laughs> and, and it's cool. It's, it's fine. I mean... I'm still learning every day, too. And you know, the cool thing is, and I have no problem talking about this, um, but the cool thing is, is we have a cool network, you know, and I feel like us as content creators, we need to help each other out a little bit more. So I'm always willing to answer questions. And Brett's asked me a bunch of questions. And, and you know, we have similar sponsors and, and you know, we, we all try to help each other out. So it's really cool to be able to cross promote and give them, you know, uh, more people knowing who they are because it's interesting how even though you guys are getting great view or uh, great listens and downloads and stuff, it's still interesting that people in here are saying, who is this guy? Right. But in the supermarket side, honestly, I'm not trying to make you sound whatever it is, but people kind of know who Brett is. OK, so I mean, it, so people know who he is on the supermarket side, but not so much like commercial side or whatever. And check them out. OK, it's cool to be able to help promote people. Um Let's get to my list of things to talk about real quick. This is always interesting. Again, I usually don't talk about this on here, but I have a list of questions coming in via this. And then I also have things that I want to talk about, too. So we always run out of time doing this. So we're going to try to kind of bounce between two. Um, let me see. Oh, that one's not a very important one. Okay, this is a great question. Dr. Cuthbert, I don't know if that's your name or a screen name, asked a question about overheat protection in compressors. Okay, so he was referring to a recent video that I did where... I was saying that, and it's the video that I released this last weekend where uh, the unit had a trip breaker and I showed you my process of resetting a breaker. So Brett, what I do when I reset a breaker, I walk up to a package unit, it's not working. The unit uh, had no power out it. Uh, before I went downstairs to reset the main, I checked for shorts to ground, I checked everything because I have a, and I'll tell it right now too, I have a horror, horror story way in my infancy of my career I went to a uh, golf course uh, for an emergency service call at nighttime because their kitchen AC wasn't working and I found a blown fuse. Uh, this was a 480 volt system. I went down to my van, I had some fuses, I put fuses in it, I reset the disconnect, the fuse blew again. Huh, so I went back down to my van and I got another fuse and I put it back in and I reset the disconnect again. Half the building went black. Oh, what did I do? Okay, so I went downstairs, I had to get the managers, we had to go find the mains and this is where it gets worse. This was a Friday night, a very, very popular golf course, and we went to go reset the main, and the main fried. It was a 480-volt main. We're not talking oh, a 100-amp breaker. We're talking a 300-amp main for the entire building. And uh, now, was it my fault that the main went bad? No, I don't think so. But could I have prevented it? Yes. Okay. I, in my opinion, the main was faulty because, yeah, I was resetting a direct short, but Obviously, there was something going on. Maybe the fuses were oversized. But regardless, the point that I'm trying to make, always check for grounded things before you reset breakers. Trust from experience with me. You don't want to do that. That poor golf course, couldn't. the electrician couldn't get the main for the rest of the weekend. So half of their building, their banquet halls and stuff had no power for the rest of the weekend. And it could have been prevented if a dummy like me hadn't just put fuses in the unit and kept turning it on and kept turning it on. It ended up having a grounded compressor. And, you know, it could have been prevented. So um, Dr. Cuthbert asked a question about overheat protection. In that video, I found uh, a, bl uh, a tripped uh, breaker downstairs for the AC. It was like a 100 amp breaker. But I did not reset the breaker. I actually went down and took it out of the tripped position, turned it off, then went upstairs, checked to see if anything was grounded out before I reset that. OK, now two things. I also had another question, which was a good point from an electrician. The electrician said, what I should have done was 
turned off the unit disconnect, then gone downstairs, actually turned on the breaker to see if I had a direct short in the main feed coming from downstairs before I spent a half an hour checking for grounds in my unit. I kind of agree with him, but at the same time, it doesn't take me long to test the load side of every contactor uh, to see if I have direct shorts to ground before. So I'm still gonna go with, I like to check the unit out first, verify if there's anything grounded. So I did, I found a grounded breaker in that. I mean, I'm sorry, I found a grounded compressor, so I isolated the compressor, was able to get the unit back up and running. So Dr. Cuthbert's question was, because I said, looking at the compressor, first off, I could see a film on the body of the compressor where it looked like it had been getting flood back, okay? Spoiler alert, there's a video coming about that soon because I did make that repair, okay? But um, uh, also I noticed that on the head of the compressor, actually... This is not it, but this is another compressor. I have a scroll compressor right here, and you can clearly see that the sticker and the paint is coming off the top because we had an overheat condition. Now, this right here is just paint for someone to indicate that it was 404A, but from the outside of this guy, the, the, the sticker's wearing off, and you can tell that this compressor head had been overheating. So Dr. Cooper's question is, doesn't the compressor have an overload? Why would overheating happen if we had an overload in that compressor? Okay, the overload is there to protect the motor from an overcurrent, okay? Uh, it's not necessarily there, um, well, I guess I shouldn't say that, but no. it's there to protect it from an overcurrent. It's a thermal as yeah. well. And, um, but even still on a compressor, consistent overheating, even if the overload is clicking it off, is going to lead to catastrophic failure of that compressor because you're going to degrade the oil. Would you say that's fair? Correct. Yeah. And once you degrade the oil, you lose the lubrication, then you lead to friction happening and, and issues within the compressor. So yes, if a compressor does have an overload, it will protect the compressor to an extent. But if it consistently goes off on an overload, or if the customer consistently doesn't clean their equipment or have it cleaned and we run high condensing temps all the time, you're eventually going to lead to other issues. So even though there's a thermal overload, you can still uh, damage the compressor. Would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, because it might be running borderline for a long period amount yeah. of time. Um, you know, a lot of times the thermals, uh, when they open it up, it's it could be a myriad of things. Uh, one thing is basically running outside its operating envelope. So if the compressor is a medium temp refrigeration compressor, um, you know, it would be stated how low that you should be setting the low pressure switch. A lot of people instantly think, hey, we want to pump it all the way down to two or five pounds to pump it down, which isn't the case. No. Um, I've had systems that have been brand new that basically had a peanut uh, over, or, I'm sorry, peanut low pressure switch that wasn't adjustable. And this unit consistently every summer would end up going off where someone would have to put ice on it to get it to come back to life for a little bit. Have you ever, ha I've had that situation too, and I've had ones where they've, uh, because, long story, because I have a lot of customers that don't do routine maintenance and stuff, but um, eventually this compressor, I've changed it actually two times and the customer hasn't wanted to fix the issues. Lots of issues going on. It's a, a, a pre-manufactured refrigeration rack, small one, under marginally sized condensers. So they run elevated head pressures. They don't do maintenance. And we've changed multiple compressors over the years. Luckily, none of them have been burnouts. We catch them before that. But a lot of times, um, the pressure relief inside the compressor uh, will get weak if it constantly goes off, right? Because if you have uh, uh, too high of a compression ratio, eventually the scroll plate's going to separate. Then the TOD, I think, is good. Uh, well, to talk to Trevor. My buddy Trevor Matthews and I are working on something. He'll be a better at explaining that. But um, I've seen that. So, so just because it has a thermal overload inside does not mean just because it has a high pressure control doesn't mean that you're not going to damage it. The high pressure control in a perfect world actually should be a manual reset. Uh, they never are. And even I won't install them sometimes because we are in such high ambient conditions. I would literally be out there every weekend when it's 115 degrees outside and customers that don't do maintenances. Oh my God, I couldn't keep up with resetting pressure controls. That would drive me nuts. Like that's a whole nother thing. So, um, let's go through and see what we're missing in here. So hopefully I answered your question somewhat, Dr. Cuthbert, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing your name right, but 
Um, real quick, this is a simple one. On a compressor burnout, uh, how long and how much do I estimate? I'm not talking prices, but how how long, like when I estimate a compressor burnout, what kind of labor do I estimate for that burnout? It's not a cookie cutter answer. It's gonna change from every single job, okay? Um, if you're, I imagine that if you're working on a rack uh, and you have a bad compressor that's you can literally park your van outside the back door it's going to change the quote versus if you have to take all your equipment up to a penthouse on the roof right yeah. everything's going to change so each job's going to be different okay um in a perfect world for me my stuff is all you know one person can carry it i might quote uh if i had to give you a blanket answer for a package unit compressor replacement i'm going to quote two guys eight hours each um and you know that's to get everything up and down also, though, whenever I quote a job like that, when I'm doing a compressor replacement, we're also giving the customer options. Hey, this is a burnout. We don't know why it failed. So we need to investigate that. Uh, in a perfect world, I'd like to come back a couple days later, check for pressure drops across the dryer, do another oil test, you know, and kind of go from there. But it really depends on what the customers are willing to pay for. Do you guys find on the supermarket side that you have customers that don't want to? really you to dig into things or no, no because what will happen is it'll end up costing them way more money than than what it you know what it originally would have because like so like you you talked about burnouts and, and remember guys you know you can have an electrical mechanical failure mm -hmm. um i'm sorry mechanical electrical failure basically a bad bearing in there from whether it be flood back or, or whatever have you and then basically that bad bearing is going to make the rotor and stator shift and basically the uh rotor will actually uh rub into the uh into the coils in there and basically cause an electrical burnout um and as far as the customers um you know d with burnouts on special on rack refrigeration you might be doing clean outs for days going there changing the filter dryers because you're not you know, it's not like you're going to pull all 1500 pounds out and do an rx11 flush and you know and do that on a commercial system yeah you know basically you're going to have to run filter dryers um you know, run high micron uh filters in there you're going to have to in reinstall uh suction uh activated charcoal cores in the suction um because after uh, a supermarket rack is started back up after you know uh initial install um we pull those out you know, there is no filters in there. We only utilize that if we're doing a full system cleanup. Okay. And so there's multiple things that have to be cleaned up. There's multiple systems. You have the oil system, just a bunch of stuff that if you don't, you're going to end up perpetually cleaning out TXV screens and everything like that. And you figure there's how many expansion valves in a big commercial system like oh, that. Oh, that's, there's got to be tons. So you're talking about mechanical electrical failures. Um, I had a compressor recently, so I believe this is called an Oldham coupling, I think is what it is. It's a scroll compressor. It helps with the oscillation. Again, I didn't know that until my buddy Trevor Matthews told me, okay? So I'm not going to claim to be this person <laughs> that knows everything, right? But I had a compressor burnout recently, um, and what I found in my analysis, I encourage everybody out there, guys, you may not be able to do it on the job, okay? Cut the compressors open and figure out why they failed. It actually is really interesting and it'll help you to learn so much about systems. When you start to see that you had a locked up compressor and you cut it open and there's this copper looking stuff all over the shaft and the bearing surfaces, then you know, oh, it had copper plating and that leads to bearing failure and tight and, and leads to issues, right? But anyways, I had a burnout in this old ham coupling, if that's what it's called, if I remember right. Um, there was a piece of this in the oil sump on the scroll compressor. And when I pulled that piece out, you can tell that it had been arcing against the windings. So I think, again, my analysis, and I'm gonna talk to my buddy Trevor when this one happens, I think that, and if it's possible, this was the first thing to fail on the compressor, and this piece fell off because you can tell that the pieces that were in the bottom had been jamming against something for a minute. I don't know what. So, and I think that they made it down into the windings, and that's what grounded the compressor out, was the piece of this. So there is the possibility that it's not just an electrical issue and that it's something mechanical that caused the electrical issue. And there's the opposite side too. So there's all kinds of cool stuff about this. And um, that's the one thing. I, when do you think your curiosity really started? For me, I wasn't that curious for, I'd say the first 10 years of my career. I really wasn't. I did my job and I, I wanted to learn, but I didn't really, I don't think the first compressor I cut open might've been eight years ago. Uh, Cause I, I always, change compressors right but then i just finally started to get like huh why do i keep having to replace these you know and it's like so then i start cutting them open and i start learning were you instantly curious about stuff or do you think you went through that time where you were just 
going to work? No, I mean, like, I, I've always been curious. And uh, basically, uh, what I, because I, I just wanted to be better at what I was doing. So yeah. one of the things that I tell apprentices to do is every week pick one device, whether it be, you know, a relay, a control, a pressure switch, a valve, and just look up the damn thing and yeah. just look up information about it. Because one time, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, you're going to need to know what that thing does. And, you know, searching it at three o'clock in the morning isn't the most fun thing in the world, especially when you've been running calls. Yeah. Um, we were talking about, you know, the skills gap as well as, you know, the technician gap where there's not enough technicians. And, you know, when I was when I first started getting in the trade, like I spent a lot of time, you know, researching stuff and doing a lot of personal development. And because there's such a massive shortage uh, with technicians, um, people aren't doing that personal development anymore because they're just they're tossed. They're tired. They're tired. Yeah, from working so I'll agree much. with that. I'll agree. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's it's you know, that's one thing that kind of hinders, you know, what you and I have probably done, you know, spending a little bit of time, tr you know, trying to advance ourselves. When right now, no one is able to do that. It's right now, turn and burn, get it done, get back, you know? And yeah. The, you got family time to worry about, too. So, you, you know, there, there's that balance, right? So, um, real quick, I want to talk about family time. But uh, uh, forgive me, you didn't give me your name, but you're a commenter. And you said you've been an apprentice since July. And you want to know, on average, how long until you are in your own truck. Buddy, that all depends on you. That all depends on you and the company you're working for. And apprentice is a loose term, too. I mean, really, we can talk about a proper apprenticeship going through the union and all that stuff. But, I mean, you can also do an apprenticeship. Like, I have an apprentice working for me right now. Um, and it all depends on each individual person. Kind of like what Brett said, take one thing and investigate it. I tell the same thing. When, when someone will email me and they'll say, hey, I'm new getting into the trade. What can I do to advance myself? When you're on the roof with your mentor, whoever you're working with, your senior tech, your job does not stop when you clock out, okay? Your job uh, stops working for them, but when you're on the roof, take pictures. If you don't know what something is, as long as you can take pictures, because there's certain sites you're not allowed to take pictures on, but if, if you're curious about something, if you don't know what this unit is, go take a picture of the model number. When you go home, start researching. Same thing what Brett's saying, you know, investigate one component, whatever. Just be curious, you know? And also, as an apprentice, there's a there's a there's a right time and a wrong time to ask questions. Of course, we want you to ask questions, right? But sometimes we've got a big job to do and we've got to get this done. So I will tell my guys, hey, look, I know you're curious. Do me a favor, write that down, and we'll talk about it later. Okay? Because right now we need to do this. Um, I will also give advice to apprentices too. Uh, don't feel like you're less than something if you're a go-getter, okay? What I mean by that is if you're the gopher that's going back and forth to the van, there's actually a lot of value that comes in that. Um, and when you're learning, right, you're going to watch Brett change a compressor, I'm assuming, right? If you're working with him, you're going to watch him change a compressor and you're probably going to watch him change five or six, maybe seven or eight, who knows, okay? But each time, pay attention to what he's doing. And to, to become a better apprentice, each time you do one of those change outs, you need to start anticipating what he's going to ask you for. You need to start being ready because by doing that and by when you go down to the van and he says, hey, I need my torches and you say, I already brought them up, bud, because I knew you were going to need them. Boom. That's how you can improve yourself is every day always reflect on, OK, how could this have gone better? I even do that when I do jobs, when I do a compressor change out or whatever, I think, OK, how could I have done this better? You know what? I probably when I went down to go get this, I probably could have taken this down always try to make your job go better i i really appreciate that super chat bud that's not needed but you're awesome man thank you very much um do you have anything else to say about apprentices it's it's all about what you put into it i think you know i of course you can have a bad mentor but as an apprentice i think that you need to um you need to research things you need to take it upon yourself to do research don't be afraid to go over stuff that you've already went over. No, um, no. Like, yeah. uh, you know, one of the biggest things, you know, I was working with a guy that's been in the trade for 20 years and he didn't know, like still didn't have the fundamentals like concreted down. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel bad, like trying to tell him, uh, you need to start reading about superheat and subcooling, like go back to the basics. But if I don't, I mean, you know, I, maybe he's going to get offended. Maybe he's not. But I mean, it's it's real talk. It's trying to make him better. Yeah. Um, you know, and you said before with apprentices, you can be an apprentice for five years. 
there, there's a guy that refers to himself uh, as my apprentice and or my stock or whatever you want to say. And, you know, basically, you know, he calls me if I am posting something about something I worked on. He's already asking me. I get a text message. Hey, what, what are you reading? What are you reading? I want to read it. You know, just wanting to learn more. It's being hungry and wanting to succeed. This isn't just a nine to five, guys. This is a career. This is something that that, you know, it, there's so much information now uh, with what we do. Um, we deal with electrical and plumbing and, and, and you know, computer programming. There's just so much stuff that you're not going to master it overnight, no. it, but it's going to take some a lot of personal development to get where you need to get. I still learn every day, and I'm sure you still learn every day. Okay, yeah, there may be something. And also, there's something, too, that I want to point out. Even if you're good at what you do, you can get uh, complacent. And you can make mistakes because you assume, ah, this is just a, it's, it's easy to get through this. You know, I know what I'm doing. I could do this in my sleep. You know, it's really easy to skip a step or to make a mistake. So you still have to keep your eyes open. So we're always learning. And that's the cool thing about this trade. Guys, we're not going to stop learning. It's evolving every day uh, with the new technology coming out with inverters driving everything. Um, it, it's, it's a trip where it's going to go. And, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. So, um, let's look at my list right here. I already answered that one. I already answered that one. I wanted to talk to you about, I have a question, Brett. Mm -hmm. Um, I will get people asking me about EPR valves. Okay. It's not a very common thing that I deal with on EPR valve. So my basic understanding of an EPR valve is that it's to maintain suction pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's there to make sure that an evaporator doesn't get too cold. Would that be a fair statement? Correct. Okay. Or, or it can be used, uh, you know, let's just say you have uh, one system on uh, on a low temp compressor system, and then that one's pulling down to zero degrees. But, you know, let's just say we have enough capacity that we could also run a separate case um, at medium temp. And basically to do that, to succeed with that, that you know the piping would go straight from the one that's running a low temp right back to the compressor and then that secondary one would have the epr in there okay uh epr stands for evaporator pressure regulator they're an inlet pressure regulator so it does not care what the outlet pressure is going to the compressor all it cares about whatever you adjustment um adjust it for on the inlet side so it's the opposite of a cpr valve right because the cpr Correct. valve's looking at it's maintaining the pressure at the crank at case. the crank case yep. going to the compressor yep. so, so it's that, making sure that the pressure doesn't get too high to the compressor essentially to cause an overcurrent situation correct and an epr valve is on the evaporator so you've got uh, a multi uh, for me simply simple terms i've got a multiplex system i'm running low temp on one i'm running medium temp on another and we would put an epr valve on the medium temp evaporator correct right correct. what would be the downside of not running an epr valve on there would we have freeze up issues what would we have so if you're trying, so if you're still because I'm assuming that the system, like my systems, are still going to have a solenoid valve. We're it, still going to have a solenoid valve and a stat. So if you're trying, so you're saying if you're trying to maintain, still trying to maintain that medium temp case without putting the EPR in there. Yeah. Um, I believe so. Uh, you were out that day, but the first time I was on uh, HVAC overtime, we were talking about um, shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about uh, you know what happens to the capacity of a, of a coil when you run a higher TD. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, basically when I refer to TD, I'm talking about the saturated suction versus what my discharge air, what box temp or what the box temperature is. Yeah. So if um, most all evaporators are sized for a 10 degree TD, um, so if I'm trying to maintain, you know, 30 degrees, I'm maintaining a 20 degree SST. Mm -hmm. Now the problem with that, with just running it, uh, you know, balls out and just running it on uh, the freezer system. Um, the more the every time you double the TD. So if we go from if we have a one ton coil and we're running a 10 degree uh, uh, TD, if we increase that TD by dropping our suction pressure down to a 20 degree TD. So instead of maintaining 20 to maintain 30, now we're maintaining 10 to maintain 30. Okay. Now the capacity of that coil has doubled. Okay. So it was a one ton coil. Now it's a two ton coil. So imagine if we're running minus 20 or, you know, minus 10 because we're trying to maintain zero degrees mm -hmm. and we're trying to maintain 30 degrees. I mean, that's like a 40 degree TD. So that one ton coil might might now turn into a four ton coil because we're not actually trying to hold the pressure where it needs to be. Now, I could imagine where I'm thinking again. I'm thinking of walk-ins, okay? So let's just say, I don't think it's going to be a very common thing for me, but let's just say you have 
uh, a condensed unit running two walk-ins. One's a low temp, one's a medium temp. Mm -hmm. The practicality of that's a nightmare for me because electric defrost, it's a whole thing. But um, you're going to mess up your TD where that really starts to affect on my stuff when you're dealing with evaporators is you can affect your dehumidification negative or positively and if you're storing flowers in that case if you're storing produce in that case if you're storing meats in that case if they're dry aging in that case if they're doing all kinds of things adjusting your td is going to majority of the time negatively affect the operation and um cause issues with that plus plus you're going to end up icing up that quote right yeah. you know we typically only really run electric defrost if your saturated is getting all the way down to about 18 degrees i mean you can still maintain you know, if you're trying to maintain a 35 degree box, you know, and maintaining a 25 degree suction, uh, yeah, you're below freezing, but not as severe if you're running, you know, a negative 10 degree saturated, you're going to adhere more ice, right? Mm -hmm. So icing up issues, you know, especially because I mean, if it's a medium temp box, chances are, you know, 75% of the time, you're not going to have heaters on there, yeah. unless you're running a lower saturated. So, Kevin, uh, an EPR valve is Brett. complete. No, I'm talking to him. No. I'm not calling you Brett. He... <laughs> All right. Side note. Um, I called Brett Kevin on the HVAC overtime show. Right. And about 10 minutes ago. And then about 10 minutes ago, I called him that, too. <laughs> um, I, this time I was talking to the commenter, Kevin, and he's right here because he has a great question. <laughs> Uh, where's it at? Come on. I'm, you're going to make a liar of me here in a minute, Kevin. Anyways, Kevin asked, is an EPR valve the same as a head pressure control valve? No, absolutely. Totally different things. Okay. Um, they're well, so they, if you could, yeah. I, okay. I get where both, you're going. They're both, that. they're both inlet pressure regulators, okay, right? They're okay. both maintaining the inlet. So right. uh, yeah, as long as he's not talking about a headmaster, if he's talking, he's like, talking about a headmaster, okay. but still, but still, but so, it still basically does part of that same thing. Right? Okay. If you're using like a hold back valve, right, is what you're talking yes, about? Yes, yeah. yes, okay. an, a, uh, a, an A8 valve, yeah. Okay, so uh, typically, I'm assuming that your question on here, Kevin, a head pressure control valve is there to maintain a pressure differential across your expansion valve. Raises the uh, condensing temperature, floods the condenser. It's the easiest way I use the dumb logic is it's like blocking off the condenser, okay? there's It's a lot more complex than that, but it's like blocking off the condenser to drive the head pressure up. So that way the expansion valve, especially on the older expansion valves, they really needed that pressure differential to regulate, okay? If you think about the concept of an expansion valve, it's expecting refrigerant to flow through it at a certain flow rate, okay? And if that refrigerant's not flowing through it, it's a dumb valve that literally opens and closes based on temperature. So if you don't have a pressure differential or if you don't have the refrigerant flowing through at the right velocity, then the valve isn't gonna operate properly. So the most common thing that we do, uh, the best way to do it in my stuff is to use a head pressure control valve or a headmaster. Headmaster is a trade name that uh, Alco coined or whatever. I think that's their trade name, but it's a head pressure control valve. And um, it's there to maintain that pressure differential by driving up the head pressure. Okay. So um, that's kind of a cool question. Let's talk about that. So when we're talking about expansion valves, what's the negative effect of not having the proper pressure dif differential on an expansion valve as far as the evaporator coil. What's going to happen if we're not flowing that refrigerant through and the valve's not metering properly? We're, we're, we're essentially, it's not going to meter properly. I mean, I kind of already answered that. But well, so it, it's going to actually drop the, when you run, uh, you're talking about running a way lower head pressure than what you typically yeah. run. Yeah. Um, what'll happen is, because expansion valves are sized off of three different things, right? You have your liquid temperature, you have your, uh, you know, saturated suction, um, and you have your, uh, you know, you, uh, your delta P across the valve. The lower the liquid temperature, the bigger the valve appears. The higher the uh, differential across the pressure, uh, um, across the expansion valve, um, the bigger the valve appears. Because basically your velocity is a lot quicker, so you're, fill you're, you're flowing refrigerant a lot faster, and that's mm -hmm. what makes that uh, do that that way. So if you're running a low, a lower pressure. Um, your the capacity of the valves essentially going to be lower, but the hope is, is you know when you're doing this, basically you might be packing more refrigerant in, into the condenser, which means you might be subcooling mm -hmm. a little bit more. So it might might cancel out you know one going one causing the valve to be smaller and one causing the valve to be bigger. So you you know you, you might cancel out um, you know basically the sizing that valve, and you know it's not like you you can't just go to the uh, the supply house and be like. I need this valve. You need to know what your liquid temperature is. You need to know what your delta P is mm -hmm. uh, and what saturated suction you're working on because otherwise that valve is not going to be properly sized. Just with subcooling, 
um, you could increase a valve uh, capacity from anywhere from 30 to 40 percent just from going from 100 degree liquid down to 50 degree liquid. Yeah. With um, again, in my world, we're dealing with condensing units and uh, we're not dealing with big racks. And when it, guys, I do work on racks, but it's a Brett works on parallel racks. OK, I work on a multiplex rack. So it's one compressor that controls 10 circuits or whatever it is. OK, but I'm not dealing with fancy parallel compressors and, you know, oil management, really not dealing with that too much to a, a grand scale. But nowadays we have some new energy requirements. Uh, AWEF is a new um it's the hippies. The hippies are, are changing the way we do things and we're saving energy, right? Think about SEER ratings, right? We have a SEER limitation on residential air conditioning systems. What is it? It's probably like 15 SEER, 14 SEER now or something like that. Um, that it has to be minimum SEER rating, right? Seasonal energy efficiency. It's hippie crap. It's, it's saving energy, okay? <laughs> um, but with it's hitting us now on the refrigeration side, okay? So for walk-ins, what does this one say? 3,000 square feet or less. So for a walk-in with a square footage of storage space inside of it, 3,000 square feet or less, there's new energy requirements. They call them AWEF factors, okay? So you have to meet a certain energy factor. Basically, right now, it's super simple, okay? Right now, the equipment has to have some energy saving devices in it, okay? They have subcoolers built into them. They're floating the head pressure down. They're dropping it way down. They're putting uh, head pressure control valves that bypass at a much lower pressure. So they're basically never going to bypass pretty much. Um, and that affects the way that your valves are sized, okay? Sporlin has a document 500-10-AWEF. You don't really need to remember that number. Just Google Sporlin. A W E F. It'll come right up. Okay. It gives you some ideas on how the valve's going to change and how the sizing of the valves is going to change. Okay. But here's why I brought this up. In my world, people go out and buy a condensing unit because they have a bad compressor. They go out and buy a brand new condensing unit from the supply house because I'm going to get a new unit with a new condenser. New, and, and, you know, most of the time they don't even need a crane, maybe they, a small crane. We're talking like a two horsepower condensing unit. Okay but they'll do that without changing the evaporator. Okay. And they might be in the Midwest or back East where it actually gets cold outside, not California. We don't even know what cold is here. Okay. Our, our winters are like 55 degrees. Maybe we might hit 30 for two days. You know, you guys in Texas, you're from Texas, right? So you guys had your cold snap last year that made you lose your stuff, right? You guys, yeah. that's yeah. nuts. But for the most part, you guys have pretty mild winters, right? Yeah. I've, I've been in Texas for, for six years now. And Last year was the first time we had snow that lasted longer than 12 hours. Yeah. So with these new condensing units, here's the problem. People are going out and they're going to the supply house and they say, I need a new two horsepower condensing unit. Then they'll buy the condensing unit. They're not doing any research. They'll throw it up on the roof and they're now AWEF compliant condensing units. So your expansion valve down at your evaporator might not be sized right, especially in the lower ambient conditions where you're now going to have head pressure floated all the way down to 100 PSI for low temp, 150 PSI for medium. It's, it's one of the two or flip flopped. But basically, the head pressure control valve's not bypassing until 150 PSI or 100 PSI, whatever it is. But that's a problem that people are going to run into. And that's going to become a real dilemma. And unfortunately, I've even talked to some of the big manufacturers like Heatcraft and Russell, and I've told them, you guys are not doing a good job of educating the supply houses. Guys, let me, I'm going off on a bunch of tangents here. If you guys are going to the supply house and you're simply asking the supply house to give me a new expansion valve, you guys need to start looking into that stuff yourself, okay? Supply houses can make mistakes, right? So even if you're gonna trust them to size an expansion valve for you, you need to double check that and you need to make sure it's sized appropriately. Me personally, I don't really use supply houses for anything. I like to do my own research, but I'm an anal nut about stuff. Like I like to dig into things. I like to size my stuff the way I want it to be sized, okay? So now that I went off on a whole tangent on that one, um, let's see what else we got going on in the chat right now. Let me look at my list and see if I'm missing anything really to talk about. Um, I had a question. Why don't I use piercing valves um, when I'm working on self-contained um, systems that do not have service ports, sealed systems, right? Uh, especially hydrocarbon refrigerants, all these new true regions and whatever they don't come with uh service valves on them so you get a call for a reach and not working and you have to kind of do some temp checks hmm i don't think that compressor is pumping then you have to access the system there's two ways to access the system you either just cut it let the refrigerant out put it back in or you know 
vacuum it down, change the dryer, then weigh the refrigerant in. But the dilemma when doing that, when you're working on a sealed system, is you may have fixed the problem and you didn't even know what it was. So if you can access that system before you let the refrigerant out, you can know what's going on, okay? So when I'm working on those systems, why don't I use the bullet piercing valves? Bullet piercing valves are a little valve that you put on there and you use an Allen wrench, you tighten them down, they pierce the line, and uh, then you can access the system. The reason why I don't use bullet piercing valves is because they leak and they suck. And what happens if you accidentally put a bullet piercing valve on a system that didn't need it, okay? And this does happen. What happens if you, you know, you misdiagnosed something, the compressor wasn't running, but you thought it was, okay? So you put pressure, you know, things on, and you're going through this whole process of having to recharge the system. Versus if you use a pinch off tool, you weld on a line real quick, and you unpinch it, and then you can access the system. If you use a pinch off tool, it's not gonna leak if you do it right. And you can leave it that way. And then you make a mistake and you realize, oh, I didn't need to put my gauges on it. You now don't have to take the whole charge out of the system. So I personally don't use bullet piercing valves. I keep them in my truck for very rare cases, but I probably sold five of them in the last year. So I have a question for you. So when you're checking single systems, um, you know, what temperature checks are you doing? Because I, I have an idea like what I do, mm -hmm. um, and I just want to compare, you know, because you've been working on a uh, commercial a very long time for your career, and I, I just want to want to compare what I do versus what you do. So, like a sealed system, if I'm walking up, before, trying to decide if I want to put gauges on it. Correct. Okay. Um, well, each manufacturer is going to have different things. There's actually some, depending on. I work on a lot of uh, Delfield refrigerators. They're okay. a manufacturer. Delfield actually has really good charts where they'll tell you exact temperatures that they expect. And they'll tell you it's low on charge, it's not low on charge. They've had it all figured out. Measure six inches from the compressor here, they'll tell you everything. But for me, I don't have a set number that I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, if I'm measuring discharge coming out of the compressor. I use some dumb logic here. If, if I can hold that discharge line uh, without it feeling remotely hot, then I know it's low on charge, right? So I'm looking for a temperature drop. I'd say maybe if I can, it's kind of hard to feel it. So you'd have to put clamps on there. But if I see a temperature drop of 10 degrees across the, the condenser, you know, inlet to outlet, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of feeling okay. But mainly I'm looking for a cold suction, pretty easy, and a hot discharge. If I don't have a really hot discharge, um, then I'm going to get a little worried. What are you thinking? So I go back to number. I'm a real big numbers guy. So like I know single system uh, condensers have a 20 degree TD on their uh, on their condenser, right? Okay. So technically, if you're in a store that's 75 degrees, then basically estimating, obviously without putting gauge on it, your saturated condensing temperature should be approximately 95 degrees. Okay. Agreed. Fair. Yeah. Okay. And typically you get about five degrees of subcooling coming out of that condenser. Okay. So basically my liquid line, if the coil is clear and I have an ambient of 75, that liquid line should technically be 90 degrees. Okay. That's a fair. So you're backwards calculating what you think the liquid line be, based on some estimations. But yeah. yeah, 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 that's a fair way to do it. And then making sure that, you know, if it's a medium temp system, you know, you're used to what medium temp systems typically run as far as like if you're running 134A, usually runs like 17 or, or uh, you know, 15 to 17 degrees saturated to maintain like a 30 degree mm -hmm. box. So, you know, once again, checking the suction line to make sure, A, I don't have any uh, flood back, which, I mean, if it's sealed, probably not, you know. Yeah. Um, but then also making sure that, you know, it's I'm getting adequate cooling to the compressor. Yeah. So uh, I'll give you an example because uh, I work on a lot of sealed systems. OK, so I, I went to go do a service call. And this is one I'm going to tell you guys too: temperature controllers. OK, when we're working with temperature controllers on systems that are doing constant cut in controls. OK, it's a coil sensing temperature controller. It's embedded in the evaporator coil. They're very easy to misdiagnose. OK, because refrigeration problems affect the temperature controller. OK, so the temperature controller shuts the compressor off. So you walk up to the unit and the box is at 45 degrees and the compressor is not running and the temperature controllers open. It's not closed. Okay. It's got a bad temp control, but that's not necessarily the truth. So I had a service technician that diagnosed a temp control. Um, it's a sealed system, so he couldn't put his gauges on it. Diagnosed a temperature controller. And this just came from experience. I walked up to it to go replace it because it was a complex conversion. It was going from a mechanical stat to a digital. There was a bunch of crap going on. I'm like, okay, so I'll go do this one. So I went out there to do it. And the first thing that I noticed again, guys, 
if you're not working in a rack room, if you're not working around things that are really, really loud, I personally advise you not to wear headphones when you're working, okay? Because if you're doing preventative maintenances on the roof, I know it can get tedious, but not wearing headphones can actually help you. You learn the sounds. You get to know things, okay? I understand if you need headphones for hearing protection or whatever, okay? Now, so what happened was I went out to change the temperature controller, and I opened up the door. It's a single-door box, and the evaporator motor didn't sound right to me, but it was moving air. Okay, the evaporator motor had failed and it wasn't running at full speed. So my technician diagnosed a temperature controller on a sealed system. Okay, again, from experience, I was able to open that door and say that evaporator fan motor is not spinning at the right speed. Let's change the evaporator fan motor first. Put an evaporator fan motor in it. I didn't have to change the temperature controller. Problem solved. Sealed system didn't even have to access it. So I understand if you have to wear headphones for your job, if for safety and things like that. But if if you don't, if you're doing routine maintenance, as I know it can seem tedious, but you learn a lot. You can be working on one unit on the roof package unit and you can hear the bearings going out on the condenser fan motor across the roof. And guess what? When we're on the roof and we listen and we pick things up, let's just say you're only working on that particular piece of equipment, but you just found work for yourself for tomorrow. OK, and you're not doing the customer any shady crap. You're not trying to do shady marketing or any of that stuff. You're, you're legitimately doing your job, you know, and you found work and you keep yourself going. So, um, let's see. Uh, this is a really easy one. Joseph asked a question about RV refrigerators because he heard me talking about propane and he was curious if the propane that I'm using is the same propane that drives an RV refrigerator that also has ammonia in it. And no, okay, I'm not an expert when it comes to ammonia refrigerators. Are you familiar with how the RV refrigerators work? Yeah. Okay, it is not using propane as a refrigerant. It's using propane as a gas that they're going to burn to heat up the ammonia to drive it through the system. Would that be correct to say? Correct. So they have, in, like in bigger industrial stuff, they actually, it's referred to as, as an absorption system. And th yeah, that I've heard that too. They yeah. basically use uh, flame or and or steam to basically be the compressor driving yep. force to raise the pressure and it naturally uh, you know goes through the system I've heard with the it's because it, the ammonia that's in there isn't anhydrous ammonia which what is what they use for the industrial plants mm -hmm. it's a different kind of ammonia so what happens is it crystallizes and basically separates so what I've heard is you know basically every single time where it's not cooling adequately you turn that thing upside down, you know, get it to mix everything back up, put it back upside right, reinstall it, and then turn the flame back I've on. heard that in those refrigerators, too. I've done a little bit of research on them, is they actually have water mixed with the ammonia, and that's what keeps the ammonia moving or something like that. It's, it's, it's interesting. So that might have something to do with why they're flipping them over. I'd be, I'd be lying. I'd be yeah, lying. I don't know. I, that's, that's getting beyond me too. But anyways, the question, <laughs> the point that I'm bringing that up, Joseph, is no, it's not the same as the R290 refrigerant that I'm using. R290 is being used as a refrigerant. It's being driven by a compressor that is moving through the system, absorbing and rejecting heat. In an RV refrigerator, the propane is propane from your barbecue, right? It's barbecue propane that has the odorant added to it. And it's just being used to either ignite a flame that's going to drive the ammonia through, or they actually will operate off of electricity too. So a totally different thing, but anyways. All right. Um, so that's it on my questions. Let's look at the chat and see if there's anything that we missed in here. Um, we're probably going to start wrapping this up, but we'll go through a couple more questions here real quick. Um, so cyborg sheep, um, uh, another question for Brett compared to Chris, how much do you work with VFDs? Well, I can already answer that one. Brett works with VFDs all the time. I work with VFDs once a month, not very often. I'm not doing a whole lot of my VFDs. I'm not doing a whole lot of programming. Uh, majority of my VFDs are failures due to uh, brownouts and issues like that. And uh, they're in package units. They're also installed in the conditioned or in the the airstream and they just disintegrate inside. But your VFDs, you guys are repairing them. You're fixing them. You're reprogramming them. Yeah, it, de it depends. Uh, you know, it, it, we can, sometimes it's just the, the fan, you know, the external fan. So it's causing an overheat, overheat situation. Exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, one of the biggest things you can do to prevent that from happening is do like a, a small maintenance. While you're up there blowing out the coil, you could potentially blow out the heat sink, which is basically the big pieces of metal mm -hmm. that are in there. Mm -hmm. Right in the back right here. This is a heat sink right yep, here. Absolutely. Um, so this this is what I deal with a lot. I deal with VFDs being installed in places that they shouldn't be. So this cooling fan on here is covered in grease. It's going to be hard for you guys to see. But um, because this is installed in a commercial kitchen where they don't have proper ventilation systems, even though they do have exhaust fans, 
it's really common. So uh, th these will be installed in a package unit because mm -hmm. of new uh, energy requirements, again, from the hippies. Uh, they put them in package units and they operate indoor blower motors on two speeds. OK, um, and so basically when they're only calling for one stage of cooling, they'll slow down the indoor blower motor. So you're not over, you know, uh, you're, you're not bypassing air through the coil. You're moving it too fast, basically. So they'll use these. But the downside is in um, a lot of my package units, they install these in the the airstream and there's a lot of grease in my package units and these things will get filled up with grease to the point that you just look at it and say nothing i can do time to change it because it's covered in grease you're not even going to try to play with it so i don't work with vfds very much at all so um let's see and just so that you guys know uh it's getting hotter than crap in this office right now i'm starting to sweat it's running down my chest uh, I need to upgrade my air conditioning system for sure. That and I, the supercomputer back here is ridiculously hot. Um, let's see what else we got going on in here. Um, again, if you guys don't already know, this is Brett from Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. Um, he was here for a training, uh, giving a training class. So it worked out that he was able to come over to my house and do the stream together. So um, Brett also does a live stream. Uh, do you have a specific schedule or you're just doing it occasionally right so, now? So like, I think I think we're gonna end up doing it um, every other week, usually on a Thursday. It works out because, you know, Kevin travels for work, I travel for work. So, you know, we try to do it on the weeks that we're, we're both traveling. Oh, okay. So uh, where you're you're doing your stream on Facebook though, right? Facebook and and YouTube. Okay, so it, it, go to his website, advancedrefrigerationpodcast.com. Okay, Brett didn't ask me to say this, but buy a shirt. Okay, <laughs> help to support their thing they got going on. But also, you can find all their platforms. Their website has all your information to your social media and stuff. Yep, yep. It also has their podcasts available where you can listen to them on the website. But then also, it tells you where you can hear them. Right all the different platforms and stuff. So check out his website, advancedrefrigerationpodcast.com. And that's Brett and Kevin Compass. I should I should preface that. I keep saying Brett. It's Brett and Kevin both doing this together. So I need to give Kevin some credit too. That also allows me to say Kevin without you thinking that I'm talking about you. So um, I should have Trevor Matthews on the live stream. Guys, I love having Brett in my studio. He's the first person that I've ever had in my studio. Um, but... I'm kind of a freak about doing stuff over like live stream. I don't know. The audio is kind of messed up, but yes, I would love to have Trevor Matthews on my live stream. Uh, maybe we can figure something out, but it's, it's, I'm a nut about the audio lag when it comes to some of these streaming software. So I got to figure that out and I'm sure there's a way to fix the audio lag, but I really am an idiot when it comes to this streaming stuff. So I probably got to find someone and pay him to do it for me. Um, let's see. Uh, we already answered that question. I think we're wrapping through these right now. Um, Right, someone answered that question multiple times. <laughs> All right, guys, I think we're going to wrap this one up. Um, so, uh, Brett, do you have an email that people can email you at, too? Yeah, uh, w um, advanced refrigeration podcast at gmail.com. Super easy. So if you have any questions that you want to ask Brett or Kevin about um, bigger complex systems, much bigger than what I'm dealing with, check it out. They're a great platform. Brett's not going to be a stranger. I'm sure he'll make it on this again sometime when he's down here. Um, and uh, it was great having you on here. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Get the hell me. out of my house. Okay. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, we're going to queue up the outro music, guys. And uh, this is how I usually do this. I'm not very organized. See, if I was organized, Brett, I would have like my stream deck right here and I'd push a button and it'd queue up all this stuff. And I'm, I'm over here fumbling through buttons going, oh, yeah, that's the right one. So we're going to queue up the outro music and uh, we will catch you guys on the next one. <laughs>